Hello, my name is Aaron Lanterman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at the Georgia Institute of Technology. This was going to be the last in-person lecture of my Analog Circuits for Music Synthesis class in spring 2020. The coronavirus made that go a bit astray. So I'm taping this lecture for my students, and I figured out also post it on YouTube and whatever in case other people would enjoy it. So the Moog ladder filter was defined in a patent that is probably one of the two most famous patents in all of music synthesis, the other being the FM patent by John Chowning of Stanford that's used in the DX7 and other instruments by Yamaha and others. I wouldn't recommend actually reading the patent because patents are a bit of a pain to read. So over the course of this talk, I'm going to make reference to things that my students who are taking the class have seen. If you haven't seen this, this kind of go along for the ride. We've previously looked at this four-stage filter where we have four identical low-pass filter stages with cutoffs of omega C in radians per second. And to make life interesting, we put a negative feedback loop around it with a feedback factor of K. And we previously discovered that the transfer function here, if you take zero and plug it in to get the DC gain, it's one over K. And so the gain at DC of the structure drops with K, something unique about it. So if you have just that cascade of those four pole filters, all four of the poles are sitting here at minus omega C on the S plane, the Laplace plane, where the horizontal axis is the real component and the vertical axis is the, ooh, that's kind of neat. The vertical axis is the imaginary component on the S plane. So this is for K equals zero with no feedback. Then as you increase the amount of negative feedback, those poles split away from that particular point where they're all shared and two of them start shooting out to the left, two to the right, and they shoot out at these 45 degree angles. This is the result of something called the roots of unity, if you think about what the, I guess it would be the quadratic root of something is. You keep increasing K and they keep shooting further and further and out. These start to have less and less of an effect, and the ones over here on the right start to dominate the behavior of the filter. And you very quickly get some peaking behavior in the filter as you increase K. And eventually, you hit a particular point where these poles will lie on the imaginary axis. And at that point, you will get self-oscillation. It's not acting as a linear time invariant system anymore. You can put in basically essentially nothing, just electrons bouncing around a little bit because they're overly excited. And the filter will start giving you some sort of sinusoid. Now, in practice, to make this work, various nonlinear effects in the filter sort of tame the overall behavior to give you a stable oscillation. We're not really going to get into that in this lecture, but that's something that people who, for instance, make digital emulations of the Moog ladder filter will worry about. This particular effect happens at k equals 4. So k can go between 0 and 4. Beyond that, these would technically start to go into the right-hand plane and go unstable, etc., etc., etc. I'm not actually going to start by showing you the full ladder filter. I'm going to show you half of the ladder. I've drawn it horizontally instead of vertically to make it fit better on the slide. So there's a series of resistors here along the top. I'm not trying to say that these are the same value. And these basically set between your positive power supply voltage or whatever it is in the ground. These basically set a set of voltages bias points for this set of BJT transistors, bipolar junction transistors. Those are basically set just to make sure that all of these various transistors are biased in the active region, what you might just call on. They are all in fact working. There's usually a coupling capacitor here that actually brings the signal in from the outside. And you need that coupling capacitor because this basically blocks changes in DC. Over here at the base, we're gonna have a DC value determined by whatever bias point is set by this resistor network. This resistor here is usually a small value resistor to make sure that uh, signals here don't necessarily start changing DC bias points on the bases further up the line. And there's also a bypass capacitor usually placed here. And this is a fairly large capacitor, usually electrolytic, and it's just trying to make sure that the value here sort of stays constant in terms of what the bias is, allowing the small signal variations to not mess with that too much. 
eventually we're going to want to talk about the signal coming out that we're going to measure over here, the emitter of this final transistor. There's a notation that Marshall Leach, who is a professor at Georgia Tech, used, although I don't think it's unique to him, to deal with situations where you have signals that are a combination of some DC bias and the quote-unquote AC small signal that represents variations around that bias. So here I'm using V in and V out, where both the main letter itself and the subscript are capital to represent a DC bias voltage, where everything's in lower cases representing the small signal. That's your actual music coming in and out. And the lowercase main symbol with the uppercase subscript, that's the complete signal. That's the sum of the DC bias and the AC small signal. Not really going to use that notation a whole lot. It's not terribly important here, but I am trying to show here with everything here written out that this is the full signal and this is the full signal. Now on this side, usually this will be reference to ground. So for VN like this, it probably just looks like VN with the lowercase letters. But V out, this is going to have a bias voltage on it that we'll need to treat later. So the main core of the filter consists of this series of capacitors and transistors. And the way I personally like to think about it is I like to think about this first transistor as kicking off the story. It's the opening page. And it's basically taking this voltage and turning it into a current. And then I like to imagine that the rest of these capacitor and BJT pairs, notice these are NPN, uh, it's not pointing in, uh, BJT transistors. I have seen one case of a Moog ladder filter that used PNP where basically all of this is turned upside down, but that, that's fairly rare. Most of them that I'm aware of are NPN. So each of these capacitor transistor pairs forms a filter stage. And you can think about it in terms of voltages. And usually when we cascade filters, we think about them as communicating with voltages. But I think it's more natural to think about these as filter elements operating on signals represented as currents, current in and current out, that we happen to turn this voltage into current. At the very end, we look at a current here and realize, oh, we can relate that to the voltage out. In terms of figuring out what the DC bias voltages are at the bases, my recommendation that we've actually used throughout the course is let's just assume that there's no current flowing in the bases. Assume that the current flowing through an emitter and flowing through the collector of a BJT are the same and that the base current is negligible. Now, these are BJTs. By the physics of BJTs, there has to be a current flowing through the base. But when you're designing with them, it's quite often perfectly natural to pretend that that's negligible. So if you do that, well, none of this here is really relevant. Similarly here, you don't even really need to worry about this small resistor here if there's no current flowing through here. You can find the voltages at each of these points simply by using a standard voltage divider rule. And so all these resistors are chosen to set those DC bias points so this whole thing is on. The reason I'm putting the primes here is that I'm analyzing half of the ladder. And when I fold this over to create the full ladder, I want to combine those and get rid of the primes. So this I prime bias here, this is what changes the overall behavior of these particular transistors. So let's see how that works. So we're going to use a small signal model for the BJT called the hybrid pi model. I have a standard NPN here with a collector base and emitter, CBE. The hybrid pi model results from a linearization of the true nonlinear characteristic of the BJT. The raw BJT has an exponential characteristic. That's something we've used previously in order to develop exponential voltage to current converters, mostly in the context of voltage controlled oscillators, but they could also be used for voltage controlled amplifiers or even voltage controlled filters like we're looking at here. The underlying model has three small signal parameters. There's an input impedance R pi, and output impedance in this Norton style equivalent R naught. And then we're basically imagining that the transistor is a current source where the current is a function of this transconductance gain times the voltage between the base and the emitter. Now, you'll often hear people say things like FETs are voltage control current sources and BJTs are current control current sources. But really, when you get to designing with transistors, it's a lot more natural just to go ahead and think about them as a voltage-controlled current source. 
all of these small signal parameters, the input impedance, the output impedance, and the transconductance gain are a function of the bias current. They're a function of the current flowing through the transistor from the collector to the emitter. As a result, we can change the bias current and then also change the transconductance. So we can essentially change the gain of the transistor. This is a basic idea that we've been using a lot when we've been looking at operational transconductance amplifiers. Most descriptions of the Moog ladder filter describe the transistors as being used as dynamic resistances. But since we've spent most of the course looking at transconductances, I think this is a more natural way to think about it for this course. And I also kind of like that in general. The VT here, that is called the temperature voltage. It varies with temperature. We'll often use 25 or 26 millivolts as a canonical example for what VT is at room temperature. For something like a voltage-controlled oscillator, you want to try to compensate for this. For something like a voltage-controlled filter, people sometimes do, but usually not. It's maybe overkill for a VCF. Now, to make our lives easier, we're going to go further down the approximation train and approximate our input impedance here as infinite, and the output impedance here as our Norton equivalent is infinite. So those just go away altogether. So look, we have magical current source. So this is taking that Moog ladder and redrawing it in this small signal representation. So the full circuit is really sort of the small signal conceptualization of it superimposed on top of the circuit that sets the DC voltages. So all of these voltages that were set at the bases, they're at small signal ground, which is why I'm putting these little ACs next to them. The other thing to note here is that VN and Vout, I'm now representing those with all lowercase because we're just looking at small signal here. So let's see how this starts off. I like to refer to this transistor here as the kickoff resistor. Let's measure the current flowing through the emitter and the collector as I0. We are going to assume that the collector and the emitter current are the same. Based on our usual assumption in this course that there's negligible current through it flowing through the base, and it's also based on essentially on our assumption that our pi here is infinite. So if I think about, okay, what's the current flowing throughout th this emitter, we can ask the question, well, what is the voltage, small signal voltage at the base, minus the small signal voltage at the emitter? That's my base emitter voltage. So it's Vn minus zero for our AC ground times whatever the transconductance is. So this is our kickoff transistor. It turns the voltage into a current. And then for the rest of the stages, we can think about them as operating in a current mode. So here, let me label a voltage at this node. And here's the current I1 through the next transistor. These are all small signal quantities. I guess that's not really specified by upper or lower case here since they're numbers. Here, okay, so what is I1? It's going to be our base to emitter voltage. So that's going to be zero for AC ground minus V1. So I end up with a minus there. Now I want to get the overall behavior of what's happening at this node. I'll write an equation for Kirchhoff's current law that says that the current flowing into the node, the way I've labeled it here I1, is equal to the current flowing out of the node. Here it's I0 plus V1 times C prime over S because this is going to be whatever the voltage is divided by the impedance of this element here, which is 1 over C prime S, which is going to give C prime S. To go a little further here, let's see if we can substitute in something for V1. We're just rearranging this expression relating V1 to I1. I get that V1 equals minus I1 over my transconductance gain, and I can just plug that right in here. And then I wind up with an expression where relating I1 and I0, I would like to get I1 over to the other side. So I'll go ahead and move this term over here. Then I can factor out I1 and divide it out and wind up with this nice formula. So I've got I1 is equal to I0 over 1 plus a constant times S, where this constant has a C prime and the transconductance gain in it. So this is great. This is now looking like a first order low pass filter function operating in sort of a current domain. So let's play with that a little bit further. We've gone through that first stage, but you can then write the same sort of equations, an identical set of equations for the following stages. So here I can relate I1 to I2, and then I2 to I3, 
then I3 to I4. So you're just going through the same kind of transfer function four different times, and that gives us our nice four-pole feed-forward filter resulting from that cascade. So I'll just write that relating this current here, I4, in terms of the initial current here at I0. And we've got four identical stages, which is why there's a four here. I can also say, well, I do actually want to know what the small signal voltage is here, but that's easy enough. I know that the current here, I4, through this emitter is going to be the base to emitter voltage. So I've got small signal ground minus V4, which gives us this expression. And then all I need to do here is to take I0, plug it in here. I can take I4, plug it in here. And I get an expression that has gains on each side. I can cancel those out. I can move the minus sign over. And there is my small signal transfer function going through that four pole filter from the input to the output here that I'm calling V4. Now this whole structure is inverting. And if you're used to things like looking at, you know, common emitter amplifiers, you will see these kinds of inverting structures show up a lot. And, and that's kind of what we're doing here. So it, it makes sense. So when you see a transfer function like this, some people like to look at this quantity and think of it as some sort of time constant. Since we're using a musical application, I think it's just better to think about everything in terms of the cutoff frequency right away. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to essentially multiply the numerator and the denominator by gm over c prime. So I'm writing this with just an s by itself. And the reason I want to do that is we have now have it in a very canonical form for looking at transfer functions in terms of their half power cutoff frequency. A four polar filter would look like this. And then the omega C, we could just read off of the expression. So this is the cutoff frequency, I should say half power cutoff frequency in radians per second. You would divide this by two pi to get in hertz of the transconductance gain divided by my C prime here. And remember that transconductance gain is controlled by the bias current. It's that bias current divided by our temperature voltage. And this is where we get our voltage control from. Now, of course, I've written this in terms of a bias current. So somewhere there's some sort of circuit that's turning a voltage into a current, usually in an exponential with an exponential characteristic. That's where it gets the ability to change from an external control voltage. So before moving on, let's remind ourselves about what the overall structure of this half ladder, as I've been calling it, is. We have our transistors and capacitors. We have our, our bias current. We have the coupler capacitor bringing in the input. And then we have our DC bias network. So what I'm about to do when going to the next slide is going to look hellishly complicated. Essentially, I'm going to take a copy of this minus the resistors and fold it upside down and stitch it on. Look, there we stitch it on. Okay, don't panic. So here's our original DC bias network. I'm leaving that as is. Here's the same bypass capacitor that's trying to keep this voltage held constant in this set of DC bias points. We have the coupling capacitor. Usually the input's probably ground referenced, but in any case, it's probably going to have a different sort of zero point than whatever the voltage bias point here at this base is. And then I've taken that structure here of the transistors and the bias current and the capacitors, and I've just folded it over. And by doing this, what I've done is I've created a differential structure. The rest of the DC bias points, I'm borrowing from the same resistors. Sometimes people try to take these lines to the base. And so what they'll do is they'll take a line and they'll kind of connect it here. They'll just draw it all the way down through like this in order to try to clean up the schematic, and then they won't draw in these lines here. Your mileage may vary depending on whether you think that looks better or not. So I do want to emphasize that in these places where there's no dot, these are not electrically connected. This is jumping over that other wire. So I've left the input and output described here in terms of their small signal quantities, even though the rest of the circuit has everything in it. We're not looking at individual DC bias circuits and separate AC circuits. Went ahead and labeled these in terms of their AC forms. For the sake of discussion right now, pretend there isn't an input here. I'll talk about that in a second. Pretend this is just grounded. By the symmetry, we've set up a structure where if I read a voltage here, I'm going to read the negative of that voltage here. 
my actual final output, what I want to do is I want to subtract these. That will do two things. One is, although the small signals, the actual music is going to have opposite polarity at these two points, the DC bias points are going to be the same. So if I subtract those, then I'm automatically getting rid of that DC bias and I'm back to a ground reference signal. The other thing is this kind of structure tends to be pretty good in terms of canceling out noises that might build up some of the circuit, although that can get kind of complicated about when and where that actually helps or not. I won't get into that further here. So in general, what you actually do, because I have this minus sign here, is you actually take this minus V4 and then subtract V4. So then the net result is the minuses wind up canceling. You basically get double the signal here. And that's one thing that helps potentially give it some noise immunity. But again, that's a complicated story. So I still have this relationship between what the cutoff frequency is and this bias. But this is now a little weird. I have these double capacitors here and I have these two current sources. Obviously what I want to do is combine these. So here we are trying to combine the C primes we had before and the I bias primes we had before. We still have the same overall structure of the transfer function. We do need to tweak our description of the cutoff frequency to match what the full circuit is actually doing. For the bias current, I now have a single bias current, but that will be split evenly between the two legs of the ladder. So I can just replace I prime bias with I bias over two. So just half of it. The capacitors we have to think about for a second. If you take capacitors and put them in series, it's kind of like putting resistors in parallel. So the resulting capacitance is actually half that of the original. So if I think about what this need needs to be, I would have something like C equal C prime over two. So I would have 2C is equal to C prime, and that's probably the last time I'm ever going to try to handwrite equations in one of these. Anyway, if you do that, you can plug in 2C here and wind up with the final formula of the bias current divided by 4, the capacitance times that voltage temperature. Now, if you want this in terms of hertz, you would have to divide it by 2 pi because this omega C is in radians per second. So you change this bias current, you change the cutoff frequency. I earlier mentioned that there was something I was kind of keeping a little bit hidden from you, and that was this. This is a differential structure, so I don't have to ground this. If I want, I could put another signal here, such as that feedback signal, that factor of K. I could put that factor of K somewhere else in the circuit and get the negative feedback effect by taking the feedback and sticking it in here on the other side. So here we have some actual examples. This is the classic Minimoog. It's a little weird. It's using a voltage here, a VCC of 10 volts. That's kind of strange. Usually these things are 12 or 15 volts, but this is, this is a fairly old design. It was old enough that at the time they didn't really have high quality audio op amps. And so people would still often use discrete transistors. So here you have this fairly complicated structure here that's basically designed to do the differencing. So it's taking this, I guess you could call it the V4 here, and the minus V4 over here, and it's subtracting them to create the final filter output. People who are connoisseurs of the mini mug will say some of the characteristic of it is the use of these discrete transistors. Notice because this will have its own bias pattern, they are putting some DC blocking caps here. Here we have the Moog Rogue. An interesting thing about Moog ladder filters is it seems like Moog music never seemed to implement this differencing part of the circuit the same way twice. Everyone has a slightly different way of doing it. So we have our differential outputs from the ladder here. It's going into these buffers. So we have some op amp buffers. It's then handled in a couple of different ways. It's subtracted here in this 4558 op amp. And although I'm not showing it here, this is where the feedback is. There's a potentiometer down here on this front panel that controls the amount of feedback. But here we actually see that the voltage-controlled filter and amplifier circuits are kind of combined. This is generating a current from a voltage. It's fairly primitive voltage to current conversion here for this operational transconductance amplifier. And it's using the differential inputs here to the, do the differencing. So this is actually the voltage controlled amplifier. A newer design is the Moog source. 
uh, still a monophonic synth as far as I know. This is the first one with patch storage. I believe it has a Z80. So here's everything needed to be under some sort of voltage control. So here, instead of using op amps or BJTs, they're using a pair of matched JFET transistors. There you go. This structure, these are voltage buffers made with JFETs. And notice it's going to actually two different OTAs. One of them is playing the role of the voltage-controlled amplifier, as we saw with the Moog Rogue. The other one is creating the resonance feedback path, that K feedback path. And this also has to be an OTA because it needs to be voltage-controllable by the microprocessor through a digital-to-analog converter. A really insane expansion of this idea is the memory Moog. It's a polyphonic synth, and I think it's the last product that Moog made before going out of business in the 80s. You see something you saw in the source, which is that there is an OTA for both the voltage code amplifier and there's an, another OTA that's being used in the feedback path. But the way the differencing is done is a little bit different. This structure here, this is referred to as an instrumentation amplifier. So again, yet another way to implement that filter. Here I'm showing Paula Maddox's Monowave. This is a synthesizer she designed that's based on digital oscillators, namely sort of inspired by the Wave PPG 2.2 and 2.3 kind of series of synths. The legacy of that is in things like the Waldorf microwave. But then the rest of the processing after that digital oscillator is analog. And if I remember correctly, this is largely based on the Moog Taurus pedals. And a modern version of that would be things like the, um, I think Moog now makes a Minotaur that has similar circuits in it. Now here's something interesting about the way the differencing here is handled. The voltages here are just jammed right into an OTA. But notice even the other Moog circuits we looked at used some sort of op amp or FET buffers. Here they're going right into the OTA. Another interesting thing is the VCA on this is actually somewhere else. And I believe this is also true of the Moog Taurus and Minotaur and things like that. All the OTA is doing here is doing the differencing and uh, selecting a certain amount of gain coming out of here by this resistor. This is now another buffer at the output here that this BJT is acting as an emitter follower. This is just a voltage buffer. But notice the control current here. That's fixed. So there's just a fixed control current going into here. And you might wonder why would you use an OTA instead of just a standard op amp or raw FETs or BJTs or whatever. My theory is, is that they're actually probably using some of the nonlinear behavior of the OTA. So as we've seen in previous lectures, OTAs are only really linear within like plus or minus 10 millivolts of the difference at the inputs. If you start to push beyond that, you're pushing into the hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity of the OTA. And I should mention that it's the same kind of nonlinearity that shows up in the Moog filter itself. If you crank up a Moog filter, you're hitting the nonlinearities in the BJTs and getting those kinds of characteristics in. I think that this is probably pushing into that distortion region a bit, and it may be distorting just a little bit, not like a big, big Marshall amp stack guitar crunch sound, but just a little bit to give it some flavor. Now, if you are a member of my class in the spring 2019 semester, if you're taking EC4450 analog circuits for music synthesis, I want to confirm that you have watched this video. Now, keep watching. There's a few more slides here. But by Monday, 4.30 p.m., you must email me a cute picture of a capybara, a chinchilla, or a quokka, because they're really cute animals. And please put the word confirmation and the number 4450 in your subject line. And that way I can confirm that you've at least seen likely most of this video. Now, if you are not taking this class, or you are taking the class, but you're not taking it in spring 2019, or for that matter, if you see this after this coming Monday at 4.30 p.m., don't email me. Thank you. All right. There are a few twists. If you think about the Moog ladder filter, if you think about these, the series of four one-pole stages, essentially they are basically like RC filter stages that are buffered from each other. The, of course, the implementation is much fancier. If you had some magic way of changing the resistors, you might not need all that fancy stuff. But the underlying structure here is, is basically that conceptually.
Now, Moog had a patent on the ladder filter, and this led to a lot of craziness. So if I recall correctly, ARP actually had a filter that infringed on that patent, and ARP was in a habit of potting some of their modules in epoxy, and apparently somebody dissolved the epoxy and realized they were cloning the filter, and so were their threatened lawsuits, yada, yada. Eventually, they worked something out. But ARP did have to change the filter. They went to one that's based on Norton amps, which are kind of like, instead of voltage input current output like an OTA, they're current input and voltage output. Anyway, that's that's another kind of filter. A very common way to try to get around the patent was not to use transistors, but to use diodes. Now, the net effect of that, though, is you're getting around the patent, but now you don't have the same kind of buffering operation between the stages that you do with a transistor ladder filter. So all of these stages interact. As a result, the poles do not all start nicely at some particular point with all four clustered at some point. They're all actually spread out the horizontal axis. And the behavior you get as you take K and you start to crank it is much more complicated and weird. And, and it's, it's part of the resulting sound. So here's one example of such a filter. This is a diode ladder filter that's in the EMS synthy. And these are very interesting synthesizers. They're patched by this pin matrix. So you take different pins and put them in the holes to patch things together. So that's different than ARP that had sliding switches or most modular, semi-modular synth that use patch cords. Interesting thing about this is these pins, you could get ones that were just conductors or different resistance values. So you could actually pick the resistance value and that would be sort of part of how things would be mixed into the circuit. If you want some examples of this synth, you can listen to Pink Floyd's, I think it's On the Run, off of Dark Side of the Moon. And uh, of course, Brian Eno, Roxy Music Days. So here we have the TB303 baseline by Roland. Uh, this was something that when I was in high school, I remember going to, I think it was either Dale's Music or McMurray Music, and they had stacks of these. They were trying to blow out at something like 50 bucks. Nobody wanted them. They go for thousands of dollars now on eBay. Now, when you look at this ladder, you might first think, hey, this looks like a transistor ladder. It has transistors. But if you look closely, you'll see that the collectors and the bases are tied together. So all of these transistors are wired to just act as diodes. So you'll see over here, here's the structure that does the differencing coming out here. That's just a BJT differential amp, very standard with load resistors. Here's a very simple transistor current source driving that. What's interesting about this filter is besides the fact that it's a diode filter, if you look at it closely, not all the capacitors are the same. I'm not aware of any Moog ladder filters where they use different capacitor values, but this one has a smaller capacitor in that first stage, which presumably has some interesting effect on the sound. So if you notice here, and you will probably also have noticed on previous slides, some of the transistors will have circles around them, little ellipses. These are representing that these are transistor pairs. So you can buy little chips or you can get them in little cans that are two or more transistors that are promised to have certain matched characteristics. And in particular, because they're on the same die, they're thermally coupled. You can hand match transistors, but then you need to kind of put them back to back and put a little bit of heat sink compound in between them so their temperature changes together, so their characteristics will change together. A large part of especially when you get into integrated circuit, analog circuit design is based on doing things with transistors and pairs because you don't know very much about the particular qualities of any one transistor, but you can know that the qualities of the transistor next to it are largely the same. Scuttlebutt is, is that for diode and transistor ladders, the important thing is that the bottom of the ladder and the top of the ladder are each matched. You match the bottom and then you can separately match the, match the top and that the transistors in between don't have to be matched as much. I don't know why that is. And I'll be honest, I haven't spent enough time looking into it to find out, but uh, that's what word on the street is. The final thing I want to show you here is actually a high pass filter, a four pole high pass, also from the same patent. This is extremely rare. The only mainstream commercial product, if you could call it that, that this was in is the actual high pass filter by Moog. I'm not going to go into the details of it here, but it's not at all like the low pass ladder. It's still using this idea of quote unquote dynamic resistance of a BJTs, but the actual way that this works and is structured is different. So you'd have to study that on your own accord and I'm not gonna really worry about it for this class.
So I've discovered that talking to an empty room is really incredibly difficult. And I now have a greater appreciation for vloggers and podcasters who do it on a regular basis. It's very strange to be talking to an empty room. And I also recognize that I think best practice for a video like this will be to split into multiple parts. But within the context of just finish out this last lecture for this class, uh, because coronavirus hit, I figured this would be good enough. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed.